Hey, this video is an exploration of great man theory through the lens of Canadian history. I'm talking a lot about Canada in the beginning, but if you're not from Canada, stick around because great man theory has probably influenced your culture as well. It is some extremely popular garbage. Just a heads up, this video will be discussing Canada's history of colonialism, which includes various types of racism and violence that could potentially be re-traumatizing for some folks. Uh, so just be aware of that before we dive in. Hi, I'm Jake, and I'm from Canada. Canada's having a bit of a national identity crisis as of late. Uh, as I'm filming this video, Canada Day is approaching. July 1st is the day that we gather and we celebrate our Canadian roots and the anniversary of our confederation in 1867 as a new nation under the leadership of our great leader, Sir John A. Macdonald. You can sort of think of our July 1st holiday as our version of the 4th of July celebrations in the US, a day of heroics and the beginning of Canada's independence and self-determination. I mean, okay, we didn't have independence. We didn't have legal autonomy over things like international affairs until 1931 and we didn't have control of our own constitution until 1982, so I guess that day in 1867 is not really the day of our independence from the crown. Okay, well, you know, it's the first day we came together as a country. It's Canada's birthday. Canada gained existence on July 1st, 1867, and that's what we're really celebrating. I mean, except, okay, what actually happened on that day was three colonies joined together to become a larger British federation of four provinces. Uh, those three colonies were Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and um, Canada, and today those four original provinces are an incredibly small part of what we now know as Canada. So on that story day in 1867, Canada had already existed for several decades. We didn't gain independence from anybody. Our friends in the East, North, and West, they weren't included. They hadn't joined yet. Basically, it was a bunch of small British colonies joining together to become one slightly less small British colony. Okay, well, there's still a national identity in Canada that was born on that day. The things that bring us together as a nation today, our shared values for tolerance, multiculturalism, and social welfare took shape under the leadership of Sir John A. Macdonald. The country we know and love today wouldn't exist if not for this titan of history, this trailblazer who was looked up to by all who knew him. That's the idea that a lot of Canadians have of John A. Macdonald. Unfortunately, it's totally false. Macdonald was in fact a total plug. He deliberately starved indigenous people, approved public executions of their leaders, oversaw the construction of our national railway using mistreated and underpaid Chinese laborers, and then introduced a discriminatory head tax so that many of the people who physically built our country's infrastructure couldn't actually become a part of the country they literally built with their blood and sweat. And on top of all of that, the cherry on the cake is the residential school system that saw about 150,000 children systematically separated from their families against their will, abused, and in some cases, murdered. Over the last month, searches have been conducted and hundreds of children's bodies have turned up at former residential school sites all over the country. 215 in a mass grave in Kamloops, 104 in Brandon, 39 in Calgary, and that number continues to grow. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has estimated a total count of somewhere between 4,000 and 6,000 children killed at Canadian residential schools. And if you don't agree with my assessment that this man was a monster and a racist, don't take my word for it. Listen to the man himself. Here's Sir John A. talking about residential schools. When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with his parents, who are He is surrounded by He is simply a who can read and write. Here's Sir John A. talking about the starvation campaigns. I have reason to believe that the agents as a whole are doing all they can by refusing food until the Indians are on the verge of starvation to reduce the expense. And when people rebelled against him doing that to people, you know, starving them out and feeding them poison, he had them publicly executed. Here's what he had to say about that. The executions of the Indians ought to convince the red man that the white man governs. Wow, that's literally white supremacist violence. McDonald's actions and policies quite literally fit the definition of genocide. He was not a good guy. And you can say, well, he's a product of his time. That was normal back then. And you'd be right. And that's my point. Sir John A. Macdonald is a product of a time and place and moral social viewpoint that was inherently racist. It was built out of British colonial policy, a policy of exclusion, assimilation, and eradication. The Canada that John A. Macdonald built and envisioned was a country built on white supremacist violence as the ideal and the default. So here's my question. Why would today's Canada, which sees itself as a mosaic of culture, as a tolerant, responsible, peacekeeping, polite, and generous nation, continue to celebrate this man in any capacity? And I think the answer lies in something called great man theory. Great man theory is a historical and political philosophy from the 19th century that sees history as a product of the actions of great men. 
That theory comes to us from a Scottish philosopher named Thomas Carlyle from a set of lectures in the 1840s called On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History. Carlyle basically believed that all of human history is the result of the ideas and leadership of great men who were visionary geniuses of their time. Some of these men could lead as kings, some as philosophers, some as military leaders, scientists, poets. But overall, anything you see standing today established by humankind is the result of some smart and capable dude at some point in history thinking that that should exist. Things were one way, and then someone who's incredibly forward-thinking came along to make it another way. Carlyle thought that this theory was useful because holding up great men who excelled in their fields and changed the world provided everyone something to aspire to. If we put these men on pedestals, people like Napoleon and Shakespeare, and were raised with the idea that we should strive to be like them, then it would encourage people to seek the best parts of themselves and follow it to their greatest possible success. Now on a surface level, I don't exactly disagree with Carlyle. There have been great leaders throughout history that have an outside impact on history and culture. That's not even really debatable. I also want to note it's so annoying talking about theorists from the Victorian era because they always have this assumption that only men can do things. Just want to put it on the record, women, non-binary people, you're good too. But Carlyle's theory starts to unravel the more you pick at it. Uh, Herbert Spencer, who was a biologist and a sociologist around the same time as Carlyle, refuted this theory and argued that heroes are made, not born. The great leaders are a product of their environment. If you want to be a great leader, you need people to lead. You probably need an issue to galvanize people around, and you probably need a good few advantages in getting to a position of power and influence. He advocated that before a great man can remake his society, that society has to make him. William James, another influential 19th century philosopher, also the first educator to teach a psychology course in the United States, he hated Herbert Spencer's ideas. He wrote an article in The Atlantic tearing down everything Spencer had to say about these social causes of greatness and influence. He wrote with a bunch of really confusing old-timey language but the long and short of it is that he pretty much thought that greatness was caused by physiological superiority in people that they were naturally born with. He made the case that the conditions of your growth in the womb will make you either a genius or a dunce, and the geniuses born into this world will adapt to the conditions of the world and will elevate themselves to success. Throughout the article, his main influence is Charles Darwin. He's applying Darwin's theory of evolution, the survival of the fittest, to the study of leadership. Here's where I stop talking about what old dead white dudes think and inject my own opinion as a young alive white dude. What James is doing here is called social Darwinism, and it sucks. This idea that people who are successful get there because they're born gifted and they adapted well to their surroundings is, in my opinion, some hot garbage. It basically posits that anyone who's in a position of power and influence get there because they are naturally physiologically superior to their rivals in their field. If you've been paying attention to the news for the last ever, uh, you'll know that that's not true. Undeserving people end up successful literally all of the time. Basically, this is a rehash of the nature versus nurture debate on which I think most people nowadays just accept that both are kind of true. If you want to succeed at something, you probably need some natural talent and you also need things to go kind of right for you. Unfortunately, when you extrapolate further from social Darwinism, you get some really ugly ideas. When you start with the premise that some people are naturally better than others, some are born good while others are born bad, eventually someone who finds themselves successful in the world is going to get to thinking that they're the good type of person and someone should should really do something about the bad type of person. And that's how you get eugenics, and that in turn is how you get Nazis. They were big fans of social Darwinism. I just think as a rule, if you say something and the actual literal Nazis of 1930s Germany are like, hell yeah man, that's awesome. You probably said something bad and messed up and you should throw it in the garbage. And even though the 1800s colonials weren't necessarily Darwinists, they were definitely of the opinion that they were inherently better than other races and had to do what they could to control or assimilate or eliminate them. This whole theory that great men who are physiologically superior are the people who dictate the flow of history became the dominant way of telling history. Anything that happens is because some genius who's better than you says it should. And to me, that's a really messed up way of interpreting the world. Sometimes widespread economic and social trends cause things to happen. Sometimes bad and dumb people get into power and screw everything up. And sometimes shit just happens.
And in my opinion, I think it's super weird to admire an idealized version of a great man. I think the idea that these people are heroes who inspire change through their inherent genius leads us to assume that these figures of history are different than they really are. When you put someone on a pedestal the way Canada has with various historical figures like Sir John A. Macdonald or Egerton Ryerson or Edward Cornwallis, you assume a lot of things about them. That they were effective leaders, that they're worthy of respect, that their actions contributed to a greater good which benefited everyone around them. And in a lot of these cases, that's not true. Because when you actually dig into their histories, often you find that even these looming historical figures are not the great men that their statues imply. Sir John A. Macdonald is a perfect example. We see him nowadays as this beloved national hero simply because he was our first prime minister. But here's the thing. He doesn't deserve our respect today, and he wasn't even respected in his own time. He was a raging alcoholic, and he had a reputation for getting drunk and surly at very inopportune times. He even went so far as to vomit on stage at an election debate. He was sometimes depicted in political cartoons with bottles of liquor hanging out of his pocket when he made bad decisions. And on that note, I want to say specifically, I'm not here to disparage anyone who's ever struggled with addiction. If you or someone you know has ever had issues with alcoholism, or even if you're going through that right now, I support you, and I hear you, and I hope things get better. But in the case of Sir John A, it got to the point that someone should probably take the keys to Canada away from him. The Governor General used to have to write home to Britain asking what to do because the Prime Minister would disappear on days-long benders and no one knew where he was. Here's the thing, I have a job. Do you have a job? If you just didn't show up to work for a few weeks because you were passed out drunk in a ditch in Kingston, Ontario, do you think you would keep that job? I for sure would not keep my job, let alone uh, have people build bronze statues depicting what a great job I did. This dude was a clown-ass politician, just like the clown-ass politicians of today. Everyone, I want you to ask yourself, do you love your highest representative? Americans, do you love Joe Biden? Do you feel a tear meet your eye when you think about your commander in chief because of the sheer national pride that he inspires? Brits, do you feel that way about Boris Johnson? Canadians, do you love Justin Trudeau? No, you don't because he's a clown ass politician who can't stay out of scandals. And so was Sir John A. Macdonald. There was even a scandal where John A. Mac awarded a huge government contract to a private company, which he had private ties to without properly assessing the other candidates. Our current prime minister has been under scrutiny for the last year or so for doing the exact same thing. The only difference is we actually know Macdonald took a bribe for it. Why is there a different standard for him just cause he was the first one? Here's another question for you Canadians. Uh, what do you admire about Sir John A? What did he actually say or do that inspired you? Name something. I'm gonna guess that some of you have answers and I'd actually be very interested in hearing them. Tell me in the comments if there's anything he ever did that actually made you think that was cool. But I'll tell you now, I bet most of you can't name a single thing. I know I can't. They taught us in schools that he was the first PM and that alone made him worthy of glory. And here's where I take issue with Carlyle's assertion that adopting great man theory is a good thing because it gives you someone to aspire to. I disagree because over time, the person that leader actually was gets lost to time and legend status. John A. Macdonald has never had to face any scrutiny for his actions from the mainstream Canadian consciousness for what, a hundred years? As years go by, people forget the person he actually was and have replaced him with the dude we see on the statues in the $10 bill. That's a dude who is unassailable in his reputation because he's a national hero, he's gained legend status. And I think that a lot of us were raised with that idealized version of John A. And we know nothing about the real man. We've been essentially worshiping a person who never existed. And to folks who say that we're erasing history when we tear down statues of colonial monsters like John A. Macdonald, I would disagree. I think we learn more about history from these protest movements than the statues which stand around funneling admiration and glory into the Disney-fied version of a man with a pretty dark resume. That theory only works if you assume that the history you were raised with is the correct one. It is in fact a very one-sided version of history written by the victorious colonial powers to cast themselves in a positive light. And I wanna throw in a caveat that I don't think it's bad to have heroes or admire people. Kyle Lowry is a personal hero of mine and watching him do what he does has inspired the way I think about life. There's artists and political leaders and entertainers and athletes and community leaders and family members and all manner of people who are worth looking up to. And if we aspire to apply their traits to our lives, we might end up better off. But conforming to a nationalist idea of a great man who never existed isn't healthy for you or the culture. If you aspire to be like a person who isn't real, you're never gonna attain that and you're gonna end up disappointing yourself. If we all try to be like that, we're gonna end up like cats who go senile prematurely from playing with 
laser pointers. You're chasing an illusion, idiot. Sir John A. Macdonald is basically just an Instagram selfie where the door in the background curves along with your hourglass figure. I'm just not buying it. I think if you're going to admire a person or a country for that matter, you have to be willing to accept their faults and you have to know that not everyone is going to agree with you that that thing is worth celebrating. If your appreciation for that idea is to be complete and valid, you have to know what you're talking about. I think if you want to say you love Canada, but you don't want it to answer for the acts of violence and genocide that have been committed by our governments on our behalf, then you're either saying that that's acceptable or you're ignoring the problem, showing you don't actually know anything about the country that you claim to love. And to be honest, like so many things, I think our lionized version of S-Jam comes from our little brother syndrome with America. They have a George Washington, so we need one too. The difference is Washington led his people to a revolution and Sir John A. Macdonald just happened to be the head government guy when the British North America Act went through. His colony was failing, so they cried to mommy and she made them share with the other colonies she owned so that they could be more efficient at violently taking over a continent full of people who were there before us. All things told, it's not that exciting. I want to be clear that I'm also not here to say you shouldn't celebrate Canada Day. I do. I love fireworks, I love beaver tails, I love Canada, and the privileges it's afforded me. But with every passing year, it feels a little more wrong and fills me with a little more conflict to celebrate this country with our red shirts and our waving flags and enthusiastic nationalism without also reflecting on all the atrocities our people have committed to get us to this place where I get to be so happy here. I love Canada for parts of its history and what I believe it has the potential to become. Our war effort in the world wars was one of the things that brought us together and created a Canadian national identity both at home and on the world stage. We added multiculturalism as one of the core tenets of our charter in the 1970s. There's the Summit series, the Golden Goal, the career of Gord Downey, Terry Fox, Kiefer Sutherland's grandpa. We have a lot to be proud of as a nation. But there's also a deep-rooted fantasy version of Canada that frustrates me to no end. We have this reputation of being polite and kind and peaceful and just sort of teddy bear-like. And I think way too many Canadians are comfortable to just sit back and say, as long as we're not as atrocious as the US, we're doing great. Americans, I love you, but I think we can both admit that's a pretty low bar. Canada has a long way to go before the country we have becomes the country we think it is. And one of the things that we need to do in order to get there is grapple with our histories and our present day activities that are rooted in colonialism and violence. We can still be the country of multiculturalism and Tim Hortons and hockey and beavers and black and red flannel and maple syrup and milk and honey, but we need to earn that. And it's gonna take decades and a commitment from all of us, especially people like me with a lot of privilege, not to turn a blind eye to things like anti-indigenous racism and colonial violence, Islamophobia, rape culture, ableism, homophobia, and everything else, because the tragedies can't keep piling up like this. We're a country built on a brutal foundation, but I truly believe we can be a force for good. And the least we can do to start that process as a symbolic gesture is toss every statue of John A. Macdonald in the most convenient landfill. The last thing I wanna do is propose an alternate way of celebrating our history. I don't want us to celebrate Macdonald or Ryerson or Cornwallis or Jarvis or people like them anymore. They're boring, they're old, they're crusty, they're stupid, I hate them. The most common antithesis or alternative to great man theory is called history from below. It's basically a way of looking at history that doesn't just look at the accomplishments of so-called great men, but looks at the common people as well. The middle class, the working class, and the most oppressed. One good example of a national hero we have, I mentioned a second ago, is Terry Fox, who was a young athlete who lost a leg due to cancer and decided to use his last months raising money and awareness by running across Canada on one leg. Terry was just a normal guy who did something extraordinary. Let's honor Terry. Let's honor Cheney Wenjack, who died from exposure after escaping a residential school. Let's honor the Japanese Canadians who were put in internment camps in World War II, and the Chinese Canadians who built the railways that connected this country across the continent, whose bodies are literally built into our infrastructure. Let's honor the women who have been subjected to sexual assault in the military, and the indigenous women who have been subjected to forced sterilizations. Let's honor the homeless population who are unfairly targeted by police, the labor leaders of the 1950s, the small independent bookstores that fought to establish freedom of expression for queer art in the Supreme Court in 2004. Let's honor the legacies of people who have been wronged and the people who have worked to correct those wrongs rather than the people who committed them. In conclusion, we should just replace every statue of John A. Macdonald with statues of Kyle Lowry instead. Canadians would vote for that, I bet. And that's all I want to say about that. Hey everybody, thanks for watching this video. I love it when you do that. Tell me what you think in the comments. What's your take on the statue protests and who do you think should be honored by history from below? Historical figures, social populations, your grandma, my grandma? 
I'm interested to know. If you're moved by the stories of residential schools and want to learn more or make a donation, there's going to be a link to where you can do that in the description. We need to listen to indigenous people and follow their leadership when it comes to reconciliation and resurgence. So don't listen to me too much. I want to point out as well, John A. McDonald was one of the people behind residential schools and that started in the 1800s. But the last residential school closed in 1996, the same year I was born. This isn't ancient history for Canada. If you want to keep up with what I'm doing between videos, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. The links for those are below as well. All right, that's it. Thanks again, everyone. You're the best and I think you're the best. Take off, eh?